A warm welcome from my side as well. My name is Violeta Bultz, and uh, I'm a curator of Eco Civilization. It is an enormous pleasure to welcome you at uh, the new Eco Civilization seminar in the year of water. This time, we will be dealing with a legal rights of water. Uh, I'm quite sure that this is one of the most challenging topics in the field of water. And it is an, an enormous pleasure to have these so many distinguished guests today with us who will explore uh, all these different topics. And please, as Natasha already has invited you, uh, share your questions, share your concerns, and we will try to uh, address them during our discussion. Uh, this year of water is organized, as I said already, by eco-civilization movement. And uh, it's uh, every month this year, we have one topic that we address on this extremely important source of life. Today, we already have the seventh seminar, uh, the legal rights of water. It is brought to you in a collaboration of three organizations, Myanmar Water Academy, WAH Woman, and Eco-Civilization Movement. Of course, it's good to say just one word. What is really the eco-civilization community and eco-civilization movement? It's a really uh, an inspiring movement of men and women that share the collective dream about humanity uh, and are committed to live in accordance with the laws of nature of this incredible, unique planet in the whole constellations of planet in this universe called planet Earth. And of course, to protect and nurture this incredible being that we share the planet with, which we call water. And our long-term vision is that with the collective efforts, we find the ways to coexist with the rest of the things and beings on this planet Earth and preserve Earth as an echo zone of the galaxy. So I hope that today we will add a little sparkle in addition to that. And we even dare to propose a new structures within which we could organize and guide our actions in order to achieve the goal that I shared with you. Just imagine that everything we organize all the time, we organize around the four most important elements for life and are also elements of the planet Earth, which is beings, societies, land, and our consciousness that consists of all the knowledge and wisdoms throughout the civilizations and generations. And everything, all of this is connected through dynamic relationships, which we could imagine in a form of economical model, educational model and uh, systems and processes, but they should serve a evolutionary development of land, being, society and consciousness. Just a little limitation to think about. Of course, behind these projects, there are, and behind the companies that are involved in this event, uh, are four women, myself and three of my colleagues. Uh, you all know probably the strongest name in the water ecosystem, which is our dear friend, Nini from Myanmar. Uh, our dear friend from India, uh, Rajni, who's mod moderating few of the events in this year, this year, and our dear friend Yuko, who contributes many artistic uh, vibes in order to make sure that we understand many dimensions that the water brings. So far, uh, throughout this last month, some very profound messages have been already uh, formulated. And 
I can share some of them with you. One of the core messages is, of course, be the change you want to see and deliver what the world truly needs. And based on rich experiences from all over the world, we, Eco Civilization Movement, along with all our guests, propose to collectively reimagine a vibrant relationship with water and the planet Earth. Our mission is ecological civilization as the next step of the societal evolution on this planet. And our very clear goals are clean water for all, inclusive water governance and women empowerment. In order to achieve that, we see a couple of pillars that need to be developed, but the purpose of our sessions is to create pillars for where we can exchange knowledge and wisdom and concrete actions in social technology field, system science, and spiritual transformation, which we deeply believe it's necessary in order to coexist in balance with planet Earth. Today, the topic is the rights for water, the legal rights for water. And allow me just a quick introduction uh, before we start with the program. First of all, legal rights for water are usually very localized. Local legal frameworks deal with them and uh, they take into consideration a very specific circumstances that the water gets involved in. Of course, when you look on a larger scale, you see that water doesn't know boundaries and it's often shared among different countries, states or regions. There are five different ways how to deal with the legal rights of water. And I have to say that when studying them, I could realize that they all have a very human perspective. And we deal in our legal frameworks with access to water, a basic human right, and governments may have no obligation to ensure it, which is a big question mark. Water rights and the location of water rights, who, how much, where, and when can use them. Riparian rights, resource owners of the land use it, but within a reasonable usage. So these rights deal with this reasonable ownership. Uh, prior uh, appropriation doctrine, which says first come first serve, so water right can be bought, sold, or transferred. And environmental rights, which are in development, and these are the rights of the environment, a legal standing to rivers or other water bodies to be represented in court and protected from harm. You see that the first four are very much from a human perspective and only in this new area of environmental rights, uh, we started treating water as an individual being uh, with individual rights. And I think here lies a huge potential for the future. And if we zoom a little bit more into environmental rights, you have here right to clean and safe water, right to water ecosystem protection, right to sustainable water management, right to participate in water decision making, right of indigenous people and local communities, right to information and access to water data, and right to remedies and redress. And even here, you could see that most of these elements are very human centric. They are not planet Earth centric, they are not water centric, but they're very human centric. But at least we started walking the path and we do have right to water ecosystem protection, uh, which uh, is directly related to the water as an entity. Within that, 
particular one, we already have some very encouraging moves that were that have been happening around the world since 2016, where in Colombia, the first river gained legal rights and became an entity that could be defended in court as well for its rights. Uh, Atrato River was the first one with such properties. And then several more followed in 2017, Ganga and Yamunda rivers, then uh, Te Awa Tupua uh, in uh, New Zealand, previous to in India, and then New Zealand added another river, Kwanga Nui River. And then something very dramatic happened in 2019, when Bangladesh declared all rivers to be protected and have legal rights. And the latest one, the latest move happened in Canada, Magpie River in 2022. I'm sure that there are some more examples, but uh, I'm hoping that there are more examples, but these are the ones that I was able to find. And uh, you could see that the, the, the steps are in progress. So I'm hoping that also with the events like this one and with all your beautiful people who are today with us here, uh, that you will all able to be able to spread this important message uh, and encourage different perspective, which could lead to a more sustainable solutions on this planet Earth. So we have several panelists, which I will uh, present uh, one after the other when they will speak. They are all incredible experts and beautiful beings who will share their thoughts and also our dear Nini, who will share the concluding remarks. All the paintings that you see at the back are, uh, have been contributed to, for this particular event and for further use by our Eco-Civilization Wing New Zealand, our dear friend Deirdre, and they were created this year when the Year of Water have started. And now, Natasha, back to you for our first song. Granddaughter, the water can hear you. The water has memory. the earth, water is the lifeblood of our own body. on the knowledge that needs to be given unto the other generations. You are the keeper of the water. life condition that we're in, that great-grandchildren will stand up to, 
to this truth of what life is about and, and to live it in such an honorable way, the way ancestors came, came to this earth. Each day when the sun rises, no matter how bad the day before might have been, there's a new chance for your hopes and dreams. And I say, Chi Miigwech, thank you for singing the water song. Nibi wabo and ayen, aki misqui, nibi wabo, heya heya. Hey ya hey, hey ya hey ya, hey ya ho. A deep thank you to grandmothers of this world who put this beautiful prayer and song together and allowed us to play it at the beginning of each of our seminars. So a deep thank you. And uh, with this kind of vibe, allow me to start also uh, the official part of this seminar with uh, our distinguished guests. And uh, I cannot wait to hear all the wisdoms that they will share today with us. And the first one I have a pleasure to invite to the world is Professor Jeff Kemkin. Professor, senior fellow, co-editor in chief of World Water Policy Journal. Your message is so strong and it really is a great continuation of the opening statements for this seminar, from rights to water to rights from water. Professor Jeff Kemkin, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. And um... Hello everyone and thanks to Eco Civilization for the opportunity to participate in, in what is a very interesting topic. Um, I'm going to talk about my personal experiences in transitioning from fisheries management to water allocation. Um, I'll talk about balancing rights and responsibilities, how far we've come in water and where we might go to from here. Um, I studied fisheries as a mature age student and went straight into a fisheries management uh, in New South Wales in Australia. My role was to negotiate new, more sustainable rules for fisheries. Good scientific research and emphasis on sustainability, clear documentation and justification of proposals and extensive consultation was absolutely expected. Before moving on to water, I'll share a little bit more about just one story from those days, the Shark Bay Pink Snapper, which still haunts me to this day. Pink Snapper have characteristics that make them a very easy target. In Shark Bay in the West Australian coast, they're genetically separate stocks in each of the gulfs, requiring separate management. In the Eastern Gulf, the recreational catch went from 40 tonnes in 1983 to 100 tonnes in 1995. We estimated that there was only 5% of the original biomass left. And in 1996, it was my job to find a solution. Additional research supported our initial concerns and we didn't find any juvenile snapper in trawls. 
it needed quick action. So we consulted widely, but we found that tourists were concerned about the loss of enjoyment. Locals were concerned about the impacts on their business. Politicians were concerned about losing regional votes. And we were concerned about the possibility of extinction of the fish stock. The only responsible decision was to close the fishery to allow it to recover an action that had only been taken once before in Australia. It was contentious. In six months, I drafted 104 separate briefing notes for the Minister, the Fisheries Department and others. But with a reasonable level of community support, the Minister closed the fishery in 1997 and it was the first application of the precautionary principle in recreational fisheries management in Western Australia. And it cost me my fisheries management career. As the reality of the closure kicked in, some community members changed their position, criticised the consultation and the decision. The minister reopened the fishery pending further research. And the research confirmed that the initial concerns and the fishery was closed again in 1998 and remained so until 2002. Fast forward 10 years and the fisheries department won the Premier's Public Sector Award for Excellence in for the recovery of the Shark Bay Pink Snapper stocks. It's now globally recognised as a success story in fisheries management. These examples demonstrate the importance of science, consultation and decision making processes in fisheries management in the early 1990s and provide a contrast with what comes next. Soon after, I was appointed as manager of water allocation for Western Australia with responsibility for policy, planning and decisions on large licences. The enabling legislation was called the Rights in Water and Irrigation Act, and it was written in 1914. Western Australia was a very different place in 1914, with a population of 320,000 and more sheep than people. The title, Rights, in water and irrigation shows very clearly the intent of the legislation. In 1997, the state's water resources were still managed under that same legislation. In contrast, both the New South Wales and Western Australia Fisheries Management Acts that I worked under were promulgated in 1994. Perhaps I shouldn't have been so surprised, therefore, that water allocation plans were being written by a single engineer sitting at his desk or her desk that consultation was posting a small advertisement in the paper and hoping nobody saw it, or that files that came to me for decisions focused almost entirely only on hydrogeology. But it did surprise me at the time. With a rapidly growing population and declining water resources, water management plans and licensing decisions were coming under increasing pressure. We lost 26 appeals in a row. Our science was unable to support the allocation limits and there were weaknesses in our processes. Clearly, our water resource management capabilities did not match the increasingly complex situation. I often laid awake at night worrying about what I was missing in my decisions. So I went looking for ideas around Australia and internationally where there were similar challenges. The 2002 Premier's Water Symposium involved water professionals and community members discussing the future of water management over three days. Very symbolically, they sat in the seats of the parliamentarians. Government adopted wide ranging recommendations from the symposium, including a review of irrigation water use, which led to a more comprehensive review of water governance. The two-person review of water governance, of which I was fortunate to be one, led to sweeping reforms, including a commitment to replace the Rights in Water and Irrigation Act as the highest legislative priority of government, creation of a new department to focus on water resource management, the first ever state water plan, and investigations of water resource management fees as a sustainable funding base and to balance water rights and responsibilities. Consultations on the fees met with opposition from many licensed water users, as it often does. After two years of consultation, the introduction of the fees was agreed, but it unraveled when several backbenchers from marginal electorates walked out of the very final briefing 
and spoke to higher powers. The introduction of the fees was cancelled and nearly 20 years later, the costs caused by licensed water use of the community's water for private gain in Western Australia are still met by the community. Further, the Rewe Act has still not been replaced. Through later research at CSIRO, I better understood the deep complexity of water resource management. Largely undeveloped and sparsely populated, Northern Australia has wilderness appeal and is a special place for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. For over 100 years, there have been grand ideas for developing the North for large scale irrigation. We looked at 12 water plans and decisions and found over 350 different factors that someone somewhere had considered in their decisions. Water management is enormously complex and it's no wonder water managers can't sleep. We felt that achieving sustainable irrigation required embracing the complexity and uncertainty and it needed a new mindset from repeating past practices to a more context dependent approach. A critical step was to rethink how we see sustainability. I won't read this quote out, but I really think it hits a nail on the head. In other words, sustainability is a learning process. Now rivers are people, some of them at least, they have this personage. I think we've come a fair way, and this reflected in the steps shown in this figure. There's now more focus on social and environmental outcomes, responsibilities of water users, achieving human rights, and incorporating Indigenous rights and local knowledge. We're seeing growth in the rights of nature movement and early examples of legal personage for rivers. There have been some big step forwards in water, and like fisheries management, some big successes. But is it enough? The 2023 UN World Water Development Report posts uh, presents a pretty bleak picture. I won't go into the detail here, but you get the idea, you've heard them before. Too many people still don't have access to water and sanitation. Fresh water systems are among the most threatened globally and biodiversity is being lost at an alarming rate. We hear, still hear many things that make us wonder how far we've come. And there's two recent examples from just last week, one in Northern Territory, Australia, where the government is proposing to slash approval times for land clearing and water licenses to create, to create large scale irrigation. Environmental groups said the plan had a myopic focus on growing agricultural business without any regard for its consequences as to who pays. And politicians should be standing up for our intact rivers and savannas, not facilitating their destruction. A new Ministry for the Environment report in New Zealand demonstrates systematic failure. The report dismantles the idea a cascade of plans, frameworks, national standards and consents is leading to healthier water bodies. It says the regulatory system at both the national and regional level was not enough to protect the lakes nor deliver the Manu Wenua, i.e. the local indigenous people's aspirations for water. Despite the progress, I have little confidence that our current attitudes, systems and capabilities will allow us to meet the increasingly difficult and complex water challenges of the future. There are lots of things we must keep doing and do better in water, but incremental improvement won't be enough. We need new thinking, bold approaches and greater commitment than ever before. The UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction recently called for transformative action to address water related risks. It said to address these risks before they become disasters, countries must break down silos between disaster, water, climate, and environmental policies for a comprehensive approach to managing risks. I agree. These and many other things are so deeply interrelated. So our ability to look at the entire system, to focus on the whole while also working on the parts is critical. And that is where I think eco-civilization has hit the nail on the head. When human rights and nature are together and equal in our hearts and minds, and when they become central to what communities expect and demand, decisions in policy, politics and business will follow. We must go beyond the idea of acceptable environmental impact and even sustainability to expect that new developments are nature and humanity positive 
and existing developments transition to it. In other words, placing higher expectations and responsibilities on those that use community resources such as water for private gain. The earth is dying the death of billion cuts and we need to put down the knife. So in whatever walk of life we choose, it's up to us to accept the responsibility to keep learning and to keep influencing toward a better world and a more equitable future. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be part of this. Here's the main references used in the presentation and here's my contact details. Thank you. Violeta, you are muted. Wow, Jeff. Thank you very much for your clear, sharp, and very practically oriented uh, statements. Uh, allow me just to restress few. Uh, based on your personal experience, and uh, you got engaged in spite of the fact that you walked in front, and uh, of course, the consequences followed. Uh, on the long run, your work was honored and at least some st some changes started to happen. Uh, but the messages were very clear that uh, in order to make uh, knowledgeable decisions, we need science and analysis on board, and we are invited uh, to use it as a tool when we make uh, our uh, calls and pledges and when we make our statements. It was also very uh, clear that we do need more system-based, comprehensive, uh, holistic approach to water management. Uh, and that the fees and licenses will not be enough in order to address this pressing challenge with a growing population and decreasing uh, water uh, accessibility. Uh, also, the figure that you shared with us, 350 factors at least that need to be included in uh, comprehensive water management uh, really talks about complexity. Uh, and uh, here only systemic view can help that we can see the whole, uh, but we can also see the parts. And at the end, the message was even sharper when you said only sustainability will not be enough. Uh, we do need to focus on attitude of people and take life as a central point, take planet as a central point and take humanity as a central point. So thank you very much. But if I may, just one quick question, Jeff. In the position you are right now, where do you think we can make the biggest difference in order to follow your vision of the next steps. Where is the action needed most? And people who are here today with us, when they go home with these important messages that you shared, where do we act? I think the most important, and thank you for your, your comments, um, I think the most important thing we can do is inspire the people that are not in the room now, inspire the people that are not water professionals, inspire the people who are you know, just in school and just coming through um, undergraduate degrees, young water professionals, new water professionals from other fields, inspire those people to take water and its position in society and the world to their heart and look for ways in which they can contribute to the improvements we need to make. I heard you. I hope everybody else heard you too. So uh, after today's day, we know what to spread and what to talk at the dinner table in a circle of friends. And whenever we get a chance to speak as a public speaker. Uh, here is a nice comment from 
Bezir, who says, Jeff, you are leading, you are leading by example. Thank you for fighting the fight. So much you have done and do much more for all of us. Uh, and here is much more for all of us to do. Thank you for your service. And uh, that, I hope that feels good to you too. It does. All right. So uh, let me move now further and we will get back to you, Jeff. I mean, uh, if our audience has questions, please keep posting them and I will take a look at them. Um, Nini is helping me as well to respond to some of them and we will address all of them. So please stay with us, Jeff, and allow me to move on and uh, Thank you. introduce to you the next speaker. Lena Salami, lawyer, conflict management and mediation specialist, trustee of Water Witness International, chair for Water Interest Group, Environmental Peace Building Association, and more and more. Uh, of course, here we just take the core lines of all of our panelists, but their CVs are so long that uh, we could just do that today. So uh, allow me to shorten everything, but please do look them up. Uh, on different social media. Uh, her very strong statement was, water issue through the lens of conflict resolution and water diplomacy. And Lena, we are all ears to hear what is your call what is, to action? What is your attitude to these pressing issues? And how can we get more enlightened by your knowledge and your experiences and your wisdom. The stage is yours, Lena. Okay, I'm loading the presentation. It's on, we can see it, so go ahead. Uh, okay, I'm trying to, okay, here we go. Okay, so thank you for the introduction and um, yeah, there we go. So I will look at uh, the question um, uh, from a complementary uh, but slightly different perspective. Um, and I think that uh, many of, uh, I realize now that, uh, of course, because uh, everything that was said before me makes total sense. So <laughs> maybe I, I will repeat or underline or highlight uh, some of the the issues that were already said. So let's start a little bit by the fact, uh, with a couple of facts. Um, we know, um, we know for sure that there is a clear connection between um, uh, development, any aspect of development and water resources. So we can see that throughout the SDGs, for example, we have, uh, we need water, we need access to water in order to achieve uh, any one of uh, these sustainable development goals. And there is actually another graph that was not produced by the UN, uh, but, but by the water community that puts actually SDG number six at the center of all the, uh, the development goals. Um, we know uh, a second fact is the what we call the James Bond effect of water that we have a finite a finite uh, amount of water on uh, the globe so even though we call our planet the blue planet uh, most of the water resources that is on the planet is saline water and um, uh, the water that is easily accessible uh, to human consumption uh, in lakes and rivers um, if we uh, take away the water that is captured in the ice cap uh, and the permafrost, if we take away all the saline water and if we take away all the water that is captured in in the ground uh, only 0. Point, almost 0.07% of all the water resources of our blue planet is easily accessible uh, for human consumption so we have a finite amount of water uh, we also that that is the same on the globe since uh, the Holocene, so since the dinosaur walked the earth. We also know that water is not equally distributed in time. So sometimes we have a lot of water with floods and a lot of rain, and sometimes we have very little water and periods of drought. We also have uh, an unequal distribution of water in space. So um, we have, uh, for example, a lot of um, 
uh, a water a lot of water resources that is available per capita in uh, let's say Latin America or uh, sorry in North America um, versus uh, much less water resources per capita in the Middle East or uh, in some areas in Africa. We also know for a fact that we are um, uh, uh, faced with a number of global challenges. Uh, the most important of it is po population growth and all the um, impact that population growth is having on this finite uh, amount of water resources. So the per capita amount of water globally is dropping uh, and has dropped um, uh dramatically in the past uh, uh four decades uh and more people means more uh competition over water means um more use of water resources and since we have seen that it is necessary for all our uh, all aspects of our development so we are using water in an exponential manner so we are we are not only more people using the same amount of water but more people using more water water for uh, uh, with the same amount of water so like if my grandmother for example needed um water for a certain number of activities i need water for much more uh for many more activities because i need it to produce my the iphone that i use that my grandmother doesn't have for the computer that i change every six years that my grandmother doesn't have and so on and for the genes that i change every couple of uh of months um uh, and so on so um we know for a fact that we are uh, faced with these global challenges that put extra pressure on on water resources, which, as Jeff said, is already a complex issue to uh, to manage and that keeps uh, water managers uh, awake. And we also have uh, a wild card that for a while actually was a wild card, but now became a fact. And this is climate change, climate change that is um, uh, that uh, whose effect is the most um uh, dramatic on the hydrological cycle on the water resources so the hydrological cycle is being affected by um uh, by the uh, by climate change and uh, we have seen that water is not distributed uh, equally in time and space and with climate change this is going to be even worse so we're going to have more floods more droughts in areas that are um respectively humid or uh, arid. So the trend, as I said, we're going to have further instability. Uh, we're going to have further competition over natural resources and including water, of course, so all natural resources, but water because it's more, um, um, how do you say, uh, it's more vulnerable, as I said, the hydrological cycle and because we need it for every aspect of our um, activities. So there will be further risks and fragility and um uh, and so we will need to to do something about it. But wait a second, the trend, <laughs> the trend also includes two crises. Actually, there is a crisis of insecurity and a crisis of environment. The indicators of insecurity are rising, and we can see it with the number of people displaced, with the number of conflicts, with the with the amount of uh, money that is spent uh, on uh, armed conflicts. Uh, the integrators of environmental in, uh, in, uh, integrity are sinking as well, and we can see this through uh, a number of um, uh, of figures like uh, the loss of biodiversity, the deforestation, uh, the quality of water resources uh, around the world. And at the same time, institutions and governmental uh, organizations are, um, uh, are really waking up too slowly, uh, far too slowly. Um, they are not very well coordinated. There is not uh, policy. Uh, there is not not enough uh, policy coherence, um, and they are waking up uh, far too slowly to to uh, to address the, the this challenging trend. Um, so, without uh, repeating uh, a little bit, uh, the idea here is that we have one layer of uh, security risk that has an impact on water, and one layer of environmental risk that has an impact on on water. 
and the impact is uh, going to um, uh, against the speech that I always uh, promoted that uh, there won't there are no conflicts o- over water, but there is more cooperation. It's still um, the case. There is still more cooperation over water than conflict. However, uh, there because of the situation and the trend that I just co- uh, presented, there will be more conflicts, and the conflicts will happen will be more acute as we go down the geographical scale. So if two countries won't go to war over water, um, as we go down the geographical scale, um, the the conflicts become more serious uh, and uh, tribes may go uh, to armed conflict against against each other uh, because uh, of water. So what do we have in terms of, uh, we're talking about the right to water or the legal aspect of what, so I'm not talking about the individual right to water, but the way uh, states uh, who are the actors at the inter international uh, in this international community how states should behave so uh, international water law is uh, is is still in its in in, in its infancy uh, and although we have a number of texts that can help us organize the international uh, society and the way it it uses uh, water resources. These um, uh, these texts are um, are framework texts, global texts that only give uh, the directions that uh, actors in the international society should follow, the principles that they should follow, like the print, like the, the some of the principles you mentioned. <laughs> Uh, Violetta in the beginning, like the principle of using water in an equitable and reasonable manner or uh, in a way that doesn't um, cause significant harm. Uh, however, these texts are global and this is their role, their ro- the role of a global convention that applies everywhere throughout the globe cannot be specific. It has to be, um, it has to be uh, generic enough to be applicable and acceptable everywhere on the globe because there are different norms, different uh, geographical specificities depending on uh, on the on the geographical uh, area we are talking about so what is necessary is actually to have regional conventions and even better um, specific bilateral or milet- or multilateral treaties that can be applicable and relevant and pertinent to the specificities of uh, um, uh, one river um, or uh, even a tributary of uh, a river uh, basin. Uh, So um, there are uh, limitations to to international law beyond that, beyond the fact that it is global and needs to be completed with specific texts, it's also um, based on the sovereignty and the political will of uh, these actors, the states. So if a state decides not to uh, apply um, uh, a rule of international law, it will not apply it. And uh, there, since there is no international police or there is no international president or a global president of the whole world, we cannot force a country uh, to uh, apply international um, public rules. We, we can, uh, it, uh, such a country could expose itself to uh, various kinds of constraints and it creates itself an obligation to repair. Um, we can go to the International Court of Justice if that state accept, if that state accepts to go to the International Court of Justice because the, one of the principles also in international uh, law, uh, public law, is that nothing is beyond the sovereignty of a state. So, only when when peace international peace is at stake then the un security council can mobilize it, uh, international forces to reestablish peace so you see there are limitations of international law um, and therefore we can only uh, extrapolate um, uh, one of the 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 provisions of the UN, what, uh, of the UN Charter in general, the United Nations Charter, and the Convention of 1997, that is the convention applicable to uh, the um, uh, the law of non-navigational uses of international water courses, so rivers that are shared between different uh, states. These articles say that when uh, states are in conflict, they have to use fact-finding, commissions, negotiation, mediation, arbitration 
situation and then uh, as a last resort go to the international court of justice so all these are very voluntary and consensual uh, processes that only can work if the actors the parties in a conflict are willing to move towards cooperation and towards uh, finding a mutually acceptable uh, solution. And uh, so why would they do that? Why would a state, uh, for example, forego an immediate uh, benefit from taking away water resources uh, for a longer term uh, cooperation? Well, because each action on each side of uh, a border has consequences on the other side. So if I do something harmful um, uh, to my neighbor, then at one point they can also do so. It's like um, we are all living in the same boat and uh, one action has consequences um, and uh, and uh, can have uh, um, negative impacts on, uh, on my country on the longer term. Um, one, this is one point. So there is uh, this, this kind of, uh, of, um, uh, interdependency in the, in the sense of actions and consequences. Then, because water flow in one direction, groundwater flows in all directions and we don't see it. So, um, uh, riparian states have only partial control over the water resources in time and space. So at one point, water is in my territory. At another point, it's in the other one's territory and they compete for the same resources. However, and the point that I want to make, if my... Uh Okay, the water. The point that I want to make is that we have to acknowledge the interdependencies that uh, link us. Um, we are interdependent, and we have to acknowledge that we are interdependent not only in terms of water, but also in other ways, and not only today, but tomorrow and in the future. So whatever I do uh, can have consequences on me and my future uh, population. So it is rational for countries to uh, cooperate, whether they are upstream or downstream. Um, you know, water knits it all together. So if I have, for example, um, uh, if I can uh, uh, have the short term benefits on water by keeping the water on my territory and harming the countries down uh, downstream, uh, at one point there will be because of the interdependencies between neighboring countries, there will there will be negative consequences because I also uh, depend on that downstream countries because of um, maybe refugees, because of uh, tourism, because of economic and industrial relationships and so on. So it is very important for people to, uh, for, for countries to realize these interdependencies and to make them explicit and even to actively seek and increase mutual dependencies uh, by uh, creating um, uh, channels for data sharing, for joint infrastructure development, for other benefits sharing, for issues linking, uh, be uh, related to water and beyond uh, beyond water. So what should we do? Uh, we should understand the links uh, between uh, water on one hand and peace and security on the other hand, uh, humanitarian agenda on the uh, on a second uh, uh, level, but this is not a priority uh, uh, order, and on the development agenda, because we need water for all this. We also need to make uh, the link between policy and science, because very often politicians think uh, of an agenda that is related to their re-election re uh, time and uh, not really for the long future and for the interdependencies that we have on the long term. Um, we have to realize and recognize the link between environment security and these crises and their crisis. And we have to also make the link between uh, water um, and the, 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 the changes that are impacting these water resources and the institutional capacity to absorb these changes. So as I said earlier, institutions are not reacting uh, quickly enough and we have to make sure uh, that we can see the link, we acknowledge the link, and then we adapt it. And what else? I leave you with this list because I'm afraid I don't, I'm not sure about my timing. 
um, uh, so we have to to uh, make sure that uh, the solutions that we uh, uh, that we look for or that we plan, design, and want to implement uh, take the crisis in a joint manner. So there is an environmental and a security crisis, an institutional and environmental crisis. It had to it has to be uh, taken into account together. We have to build capacity and make sure that people at all levels of decision making. So from the highest to the uh, lowest level understand the crisis and are engaged in it because if local people are not engaged in a solution they don't like changes and if changes come without their being uh, them being consulted and engaged then it's a recipe for fiasco uh, so yeah thank you lena i mean uh, yes we could listen to you much much longer but uh, we have to keep in mind the agenda of course of yeah, yeah. It was fascinating the way how you brought forward all these critical uh, moments and tensions that are evolving in the relationship to water. Besides facts and global challenges that you mentioned, I think uh, really important are these connections between the science, politics, long term planning, which is not present in any politics around the world right now. And we are very much invited to really have this big picture, especially not in democratic worlds. This is a big question, how to resolve in democratic societies to get uh, uh, this four-year focus and to really have a uh, long-term focus on what matters for the entire ecosystem and the entire system. Mm -hmm. So the other one that you really stress strongly is this links between humanity, water, peace, and development agenda. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like too much what you sort of uh, hinted that uh, this, uh, I mean, this favorable position of collaboration uh, might soon be replaced by conflicts uh, in, in, in majority. I think this is a clear call to all of us that we have to put every effort that we can together and all the energies together to continue to uh, resolve these issues on a collaborative and uh, diplomatic level. But one question for you, very quick one. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff mentioned in his message, right to water versus right for water. I mm -hmm. heard you saying right to water. Do you think we have a capacity and uh, where would you press to develop the capacity to move to right for water? Okay, so uh, one. let me just backtrack one second. Please don't misunderstand me. I am totally for water cooperation. I know, I know, but the situation yes. in the world is... Yes, the situation is difficult. There will be yes. more competition, but conflict and cooperation always coexist at different extents. Yes. So as long as they coexist, we are safe. Yes. Um, so uh, the, the the right to water is the right um, in my in my legalese uh, understanding is the right of individuals to water and it creates obligation for states to maintain to um, to guarantee uh, and to protect this this right and we have a couple of UN uh, texts that uh, in two thousand understand Lena but I'm just asking you being a lawyer yes. what will it take to move to the right for water. The the right for water for the the, the so, so if I understand water as a being. As a yeah, as a being. So it, there there is a, there are a few examples where uh, we already have this, and I think that the best um, inspiring um, practices uh, are um, within the hands of the indigenous people that recognize the right for water as a as a as a body that, uh, that deserves being pro the protection. And is is this what you uh, are looking for? Uh, the right to yeah, maybe I can extend this to what one of our listeners uh, participants put in the chat he says samravit says that thank you very much for the presentation uh, in some countries mostly in the global south water resources are managed by traditional laws from indigenous people how right. do you see them integrated in the modern governance and modern law 
Mm, 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 mm. Um, it, it it is starting to um, instead of saying trickle down, go up actually, and there is a recognition actually uh, uh, in a couple of uh, of cases uh, where uh, indigenous people have uh, are being engaged into the decision making processes that are related to um, to a water body, and then their knowledge, their customs, their traditions are being integrated. But this is like everything else especially when we are developing law it is very slow it's a slow monster um but all the work that we are doing uh and that uh, an, an ngo like eco civilization is doing uh moves towards this so we have uh, we have um and in between we have academia uh, who is also trying to make uh, the transition between uh, the policy makers the lawmakers and the traditionals so mm. i i think that there is a recognition and this is maybe a link that i have to add in my slide the link between the traditional knowledge and uh, the, poli the the policy development thank you thank very you. much Thank you, Lena, very much for this uh, very insightful presentation as well. Please stick around because mm -hmm. uh, questions and comments are appearing. Check the link. And uh, I have a pleasure to move on and to in invite to the world to our next distinguished speaker, Dr. Wang Xian, uh, Associate Professor uh, in International Law uh, Ohio University, uh, also very active as a professor of international relations, Johns Hopkins Nanjing Center at the Nanjing University, member of Water Law Professional Committee of China Hydraulic Society. His message and his title is very descriptive as well. Basin rights, the water rights problem for nature, people, and the states in the 21st century. And uh, Dr. Wang, thank you for your message also on social media. It was really well received, your statement uh, about being really simple, humble, and uh, uh, with the energy, pleasant energy. And with that energy, we can reach really far. The stage is yours. Uh, I'm afraid his mic is off. No. No, his mic is on, but we can't hear him. Mr. Zihian? Professor Wang, you are still muted. We cannot hear you. Could you check your computer? on your site. Maybe you could check the video settings. Sometimes it happens to me too. You go to choose virtual uh, video settings and under video settings, there might be under the audio, there might be, uh, there you might need to put on some additional features. Please go on. Volunteer. Perfect. We hear you. Great. Yeah, yes, you can yes, tell me, please right? Please go ahead, Mr. Uh, okay, Professor thank you. Wong. Thank you so much. I use my uh, iPhone. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you, Violeta, for the introduction. Can you hear me, right? Yes, yes, speak. we hear you well okay, now. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. So my my uh, topic is based on rice, what, the world rice problem for nature, people, and the states in 21st century. Uh, I will 
part, my uh, top into three parts, divided into three parts. The one is from water rice to basin rice. The second is basin rice approach is my main part. And the third is basin rice approach for eco-civilization. So before I start my first part, I would like to give some uh, rest now for this topic. So there are three sentences I'd like to uh, address. In 21st century, eco-civilization movement says, this to collectively reimagine a vibrant relationships with water and the planet Earth. It's, I bought this idea from the official website. In 21st century, water resources have been securitized because of its comparatively scarcity. In order to manage water sustainability as a base of our eco-civilization building, we need to rethink our relationship between human and nature. And inevitably, the relation between nature and our political community, that is states or province or county. Right, the second sentence, we must empower natural rights for river, the human rights for people, for basin people or local people. And additional, additionally, last but not least, water rights for basin states. At this point, the states means country, right? Uh, to reform our past view of our people centralized or human centralized concept of relationship between people and water. We need to empower the rise of water, the river, that is, the living river rise, such as mentioned above by Voleta, Magpie River in Canada, and or River in Bangladesh, or Ganga in India. To empower the human rights for the basic people has been emphasized for at least two seconds. In 2002, the United Nations Committee on the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights adopted its general comments on level 15 on rights to water, defined define the rights of everyone to sufficient, safe, acceptable, physically acceptable and affordable water for personal use and dom domestic use. And last but least, we must empower the rights for states. We may call that the collective water rights for political community, political community, because we still live in a political society, especially we cannot escape the politics as social beings. Most times we had to count on states, province or county to protect our individual home water rights, whether domestically or individually or internationally. Needless to say a rise of a river or the rise of water. So, the third sentence is water's eco civilization requires the states to undertake to undertake the responsibility of establish a justice water governance framework. At the same time, since the government is a collectively entity we authorize, we must be undertake the responsibility to build a justice water framework whether within its sovereignty or within an international basin. That is, they have to cooperate to build a just river basin organization to manage international river. So let's, all, let's move to part one, from water rise to basin rise. I like to divide this to three points, the water rise mainly focus on the domestic water rights, its domestic difference from 
country to country. It means the right to use water mainly, especially water taken rice. However, there's some difference between a, a public ownership state and a private ownership state. The former always emphasize the state ownership and the latter always emphasize the private ownership. The former like China, right? The second point is about modern water rights. It always means a certain amount of water. Before this, we can calculate, calculate the quantity of water. The water dry system always divided into two categories, the requirements rise or the prior operation doctrine as a uh, relative per se. Uh, but in 20, in 2006, uh, FAO issued a uh, modern water rights theory and practice. In the whole publication, uh, a certain amount of water or volume of water always been the major point of water rights, especially in domestic sense. So I propose the basin rights in nowadays because we cannot just mention water rights to water, we must emphasize the water rights for nature, people, and states, and states, right? Move to part two. What is my basin rights approach? My basin rights approach meant should be described as a, uh, this three to Four parts. The basin to the annual discharge, we, uh, um, we say that is representative B, the B representative basin to the annual discharge or runoff. The A represents natural water rights for river, that is, uh, natural rights for river or water rights or environment or ecological things. And H means human water rights for people, right? So if you uh, like to calculate the whole water rise for the whole basin, you must you must reserve the nature rights and human rights at first. Then you have the whole water rise for the whole states, uh, for the whole basin states or the whole basin. But the individual state has been equal to uh, this, this amount plus contribution rate. That means if you contribute a lot, you may get a lot of water rights for your own state. That is my basic approach. This basic approach calculation quantities has been unveiled in my website at Capacity for Development at Europa EU. Uh, public group uh, since uh, 2006, the basin rise. Uh, it has been calculated about 276 international river basins in the world. So you can see that in my website, a uh, public group webpage, but it has archived, no, it does, maybe because of several months, I did not log in. And I use this to uh, calculate Mekong River Basin and use this basin uh, uh, rice approach to uh, train my students to dialogue, to negotiation. So, and I use this uh, idea to to some uh, project in, in Laos, a uh, hydropower project. And even I assume this basin rice approach can adapt to domestic basin. This map shows that 1922, the convention between seven states about the Columbia, uh, Colorado River, uh, they divided the whole discharge of this water 
in, in seven parts completely. They did not, did not uh, consider the natural, the river living right. There's a lot of drought nowadays in West US, right? So if, if nowadays there's some blank uh, situation in the world in some place in domestically, we can use this approach to calculate their rights, their province rights, their state's rights, their American county rights, uh, because uh, it's a uh, national security things. We cannot get some a detailed database from them. Okay. So, what the significance for me to to propose such approach? I propose to base to form a base wide treaty organization based on such approach. A voting mechanism that is equal vote for base and state statute status and rate for water rights, the state for this collective water rights. So what can we build a voting mechanism is we must have the them both majority votes voting, that is, you must get the major, majority of state death agreement consent and a major water rights amount. Oh, this is this idea has been uh, linked to OSC program in water conflict and managing it as transportation. Let's move to my part three. Based on rights for eco civilization. What is eco civilization? Maybe we like to emphasize the natural centric or natural authorization, but we cannot live without human beings. As Genesis 1 86, 80, uh, 28, I emphasize the man to substitute the nature, not to just to undo the nature, right? That is our civilization, eco-civilization means at first. We cannot just press nature, but that we still cannot be undo the nature, right? I bought this from the website of uh, the eco-civilization. I had dream that is well later spoke about the a movement and a community for evolutionary transform of towards a new civilization or paradigm. Maybe we can move from these steps, we can change the world rise to basic rise. That's all. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for this very far reaching uh, presentation and a very concrete proposal, which definitely needs to be further looked at and discussed and see what it means that for a concrete uh, for a concrete uh, cases. But I'm sure you've done a lot of that. So please stay around and stay with us and even in the future discussions. And uh, let's see what your formula can bring. But I'm not the expert, I'm, I cannot judge. Uh, please allow me to just maybe call Jeff for a quick comment. Jeff, what do you think about the proposed formula of Dr. Wang? It looks very uh, advanced, innovative, and uh, inclusive. Yes, it was very, very interesting. Um, probably need to uh, look into it a little bit more, more detail, maybe discuss it with, with Dr. Wang. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be a pleasure, um, but uh, on the face value, it looked very interesting. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It's new. I, we haven't seen anything like that presented. Lena, what do you think? It's something like that could be used for international law? You're muted, Lena. Uh, 
Okay, it seems like we lost her. I saw her a second ago and now we lost her. But definitely, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wang. This was something fresh and new. And as I said, I would love to stay in touch and continue to engage with you. Uh, it's really important what you pointed out, these three elements that we all need to consider is the right of nature, right of local community, and the right of basin states. Uh, if we can bring this into a balance, this is ideal. Uh, so mm -hmm. it would be great to see uh, how can that be uh, transpositioned in uh, international law and uh, brought forward. So thanks a lot. Uh, and you. please allow me to move on. Uh, now that I want to press too many, too much by time, people. But uh, we, uh, I would certainly invite panelists to stick with their time because we do want to have a little bit for the final discussion and and, and exchange of uh, information. Uh, it is a great pleasure now to invite to the stage Dr. On Yind, World Bank consultant, former senior water resource engineer uh, at the World Bank. And uh, his statement says, some options for resolving water crisis under the climate change threat. So what is that? And I'm all curious. The stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid you're muted, Mr. Nint. If you could just, uh, Natasha, could you unmute him, please? Uh, at the bottom uh, of the screen of Zoom, uh, Mr. Mint is on the left side, it's a little microphone. And if you press on it, uh, it I will. Hey, it is. Yes, now. yes, yes. Okay. The stage is yours. Yeah. Uh... As you know, uh, uh, thank you very much for giving me a, a slot on your very important uh, webinar. And I'm very thankful to all the panelists as well as to the uh, Madam Chair for that. My today presentation will be a little bit uh, uh, different from what the theme sets for, for that. Please uh, pardon me if it is not uh, totally uh, right to your requirement. What I'm saying today would be, as we all know that water is a derivative of climate. Uh, since industrialization in 80, uh, the mid 18th century, we have already accepted that the climate change has progressed. This has caused the prolonged droughts and floods which can be mitigated by building a climate resilient society and ecosystem and reducing carbon emission only. For that, everyone has a role to play in mitigation of the drought and the flood. And today my presentation will be the discussion about what we have done so far for within our capacity for the mitigation of flood and the drought. I hope that you can hear me quite well, right? Very well. Yeah. The, most of my slides, are, I have written uh, almost a uh, full explanation that I don't need to, I will be very quick and you have a time pressure also as I understand it. A drought is a abnormally low rainfall or no rainfall, which make the shortage of water makes the environment hot and dry, dusty. And in, under that drought, there may be cracks appear in the soil, river, lakes, and streams. All levels are declining. And at the same time, uh, this, sometimes it can create even the forest fire and so on. I'll come back to the, uh, later about this. Drought, unlike flood, has no visible harm part. Water can produce benefit as well as the harm. But the in the case of drought, you don't see the, the harm's way like in the flood. Whereas in the flood, 
flood is a large amount of water beyond it, uh, the normal confines. What I mean confine is the river body, stream body, within which if the river is flowing, it is okay. But as soon as it is, there is a large amount of water, it started fill up the covering the adjacent land, which we call it flood. Yeah, Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, my slide was not uh, visible, Nini said. Did you see now? Screen share, you uh, at the bottom of the Zoom Yeah, screen. yeah, yeah, I, I, I need to screen share, right? Yeah, just press share yeah. screen, like we did in, yes. Perfect, now we can see it, go ahead. Yeah, you can see the slide. Eh? Okay, I will go to the, uh, what do you call it? slideshow from the beginning. Is that okay? Mine is stuck. Yes, so it's I very good. Do that. Yes, go ahead. In that way I will flow. So flood is the large amount of water, which because of, of which uh, it is, it doesn't stay within the confine of the river in the stream and started overflowing to the adjoining land. And in the case of the flood, the problem is we have a loss of life, but in the case of drought, you may or may not have it, uh, the, as like uh, in the case of flood, it is not, uh, uh, the loss of life is very rare, but in some cases also, especially the old people, they lost their life because of overheated environment and so on. But in the case of flood, if somebody is in the harm way, definitely he'll be affected by that uh, up to the, uh, the, his uh, life. So that is a difference between the, the flood and the drought, even though both are the water crisis. And the drought generally is generated by the, uh, the caused by the nature and except for the some cases, which I, during my experience, uh, the, the around the wall, I found somewhere in Africa that they have overdrawn, overused the reservoir. And at the time of in the middle of the summer, there was no water in the reservoir, even though it was meant for the town water supply and so on. So except for that kind of thing, it is not anthropogenic. Usually it is not man-made. Drought is uh, dr driven by the nature. The loss of life is also very rare in the case of uh, the drought. But there are some cases, especially old people lost their life because of over the very hot weather and so on. In US, we have to bring them to the refuge where the, it is air conditioned and the people can stay uh, until the drought is over. Sometimes the drought is not yet, not a short uh, period of time. It may take about uh, weeks or in months. And in, in the case of West, uh, Dr. Wen said, uh, said, in the case of Western United States, the drought has been there for more than four or five years. So it is, uh, it is not as drastic as uh, the, in terms of the human life, life. It is not a drought, is not as bad as a flood, but the flood, but there is also a loss of production because of the drought, your crops and all that can be lost. And then over and above, there's a forest fire nowadays happen in United States as well as major Loss of uh, under the forest fires are in the United States as well as in Australia. So, what are we going to? Uh, what are we trying to do under the condition of the drought? Drought is two way. One is water conservation, and the other is to reduce your demand, which is also not easy to reduce your demand because it is all connected with your economic activities and so on. But the, the general rule is water scheduling and water rationing. Dr. Wan uh, uh, touch up this Colorado River Basin. I just want to elaborate a little bit. Colorado River Basin in the United States is shared by seven states. And it is used for supplying the water to about 40 million people. 40 million in some cases is more than one country. So, and also it is irrigating for about 4 million hectares. 
a four million acres of land. So, as I st stated earlier, there was a drought happened since last four or five years continuously. And what happened is that finally in US, water is the state subject, like in India and elsewhere. So when you touch up the issue, I have to uh, refer to Lena also that the country constitution was also very important where whether your country in your country institution, whether it's a state subject or the federal subject. So in the case of United States, whether it's the, the more like India, it is a state subject, whoever has a land has a water right. So because of that, they have a problem of sharing when the droughts come in. They are short of water for continuously four or five years. And what they have to do is Finally, they have to go to the state, uh, the federal government, and the federal government started impose uh, the the water quota, like water sharing or water rationing. You have to cut 15% from everybody. You have to uh, uh, cut your usage. So that is one way of eliminating or mitigation from the drought. The other way is more like. Uh, introducing the efficient water supply and irrigation system. Uh, uh, Professor Jeff also said about irrigation. Irrigation is a major water use. So whenever you have a problem with the water uh, drought or water shortages, the first thing to do is to see your major water users, which is irrigation. And the other mini uh, the mitigation effects are to fix your uh, leaky infrastructure, implementing water saving technology, starting from the household up to the society, up to the towns and basin wise, of course. And at the same time, like you all are doing now, you have to raise the awareness and responsibility of the water use. I would like to touch up here. When you uh, call for the awareness, you have to educate the people also, not uh, only the adult, but in Japan and elsewhere, they have educate their kids uh, right from the, the usage of the water, right from the, the, the children. So uh, by growing up, they understand about the value of the water. And among the enhancement, uh, the first thing is water har harvesting. We have a saying that, uh, make hay while the sun shines. So whenever you have a bigger amount of water available from the drain or the, the rain in the form of a rain, you can harvest the water. I went uh, in, in my <laughs> walking uh, the duration, I went to a country where they are complaining about water shortages. But when I look at their homes, none of the homes has a, the gutter to capture the water. So sometimes it is very important to have the water or capture the uh, rainfall and try to harvest the rain provided by the nature in case of a drought. We have a water supply system in this country, but the water value, we have to pay for the water charges, especially the sewerage charges. It is about quite expensive, about one meter cube, it costs about $3 or so. So people are sometimes harvesting from the ray and they try to make use of the water for other purposes, like not portable purposes, not for drinking water, but for their gardening and for car wash and some other thing. That is the benefit of having this rain harvesting or otherwise you can put the rain into the ground by having that you are not promoting to the flood, which would otherwise be on the street. This All this water will be on the urban, especially in the urban where all the grounds are sealed. The water will come to, there is no place for the water to go or to seep through the ground. By having your, your underground tank, whether it is lined or unlined, you can feed to the groundwater system. So this is enhancement of the shortage of water in one way. And the other solution is more like a, uh, the attacking the, the nature by providing some kind of, uh, we call it cloud seeding. 
tried to create the artificial rain by uh, broadcasting the silver iodide particles into the atmosphere. And that is also done, especially, this is very expensive. It is especially uh, used in uh, the rich country like United uh, UAE and, and also in uh, California and uh, where, and also in Nevada where these are the dry state in the United States. But the drawback of this is that silver iodide never dissolved in the water. So in some cases, even though it is useful and it is very localized, you can get a localized rain, but you must have a very good observation on the, uh, the cloud cloudiness and thickness of the cloud and so on and so forth. But some corporation make use of that um, uh, methodology in order to, uh, to uh, supplement their, their rainfall, natural rainfall in case of drought. And the last, uh, the, the way of resolving is moisture sequestration, we call it. The air by somehow or other has the moisture. So now people, especially in those uh, in the dry, dry area and desert area, they try to capture the moisture from the clouds, making use of this porous material, which is like a sponge, like a chemical structure with microscopic space that can trap the molecules of the water. And uh, they make use of that, but they get that, uh, as I understand in uh, Navajo Nation, where the reservation, we have a Native American live in the desert and they try to capture the moisture in that way. And it is good only for the use of drinking water, they get it, the amount they get it is not, not commensurate with the technology or expenses they have to pay for that. The, uh, the, the, these are all the, the active uh, way of enhancing the water, but the passive way is you try to frame your Self by making use of your water infrastructure to, to uh, repair, to try to make the operation and maintenance, change the operation reservoir operation rule and the operation rule of all your water supply systems, try to find out the leakage and the seepage and all that type of stuff. And if all these are exhausted, what you have to do as a defense system is this covering the evaporation surfaces with the water shield. That in US, they use this water shield. I'm just showing this very briefly, this, uh, uh, the water shield, they use a plastic pellet, plastic ball for covering the water surface. I think it is a little bit slow. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor On. This was a very okay. important yeah, list. I, I, I know that you have a time pressure. Okay, please go ahead. No, I just said that this, you provided us with a very thorough list of all possible technologies that we could use or interventions in order to ensure better governance, better management, and better access to water resources. And you stared quite some comments in the chat uh, where people shared stories uh, from India, for example, post stories of, uh, of uh, already uh, evolving disputes over the water that you also mentioned. And then uh, they overstressed again and again the important message that you sent regarding the education. Uh, so um, this, this is definitely one of the huge maybe untapped resources that we could use in order to proliferate and uh, expand the activities in, in the areas of water. Um, so please just one last sentence for the completion of your, uh, of your uh, presentation, because okay. we already, uh, you used yeah, your time I, I, and I, we're I, running late. So please. Yes, I, I know that. So this is, I just want to uh, highlight this uh, important aspect. As of now, as uh, Lena in her presentation also said that what we are now using as a fresh water is only 1% of, even less than 1% of total availability. And because of that, we have uh, tried to store 
uh, make the storage and all uh, all over the wall. And according to the recent, uh, it, this has already been in the preparation of uh, to publish by the World Bank. The recent analysis by the uh, Global Water Partnership and IWMI found that globally water storage is declining. This is a graph that I have shown. There exists a large gap uh, between the amount of water stored and the amount of water required for various purposes, diminishing by about 27 trillion meter cubed at present. But the future is also not very good because of the fact that in the last 50 years, global population has increased by twofold. And yes. at the same time, or because of the climate change effect, they are, the glaciers are melting, snowpacks are also reducing. And at the same time, because of the population thrust, the, the, and the expansion of the city and the town, our natural wetland and floodplains, which are producing the fresh water are also reducing, the areas are also reducing. So, and at the same time, uh, because of industrialization, the good point is that our living standards are getting better and better. And the living standard come along with the, with the high the price, high yes. price, which yes. is the usage of water is increased by 1.5 times. Yes. So Thank if, this you. Con if this continue, the future is not very good. And the if you have uh, in Lena presentation, uh, one last point, there is... Uh, uh, called permafrost. Permafrost is a layer of earth underneath the century-old the ice cap in mm. Alaska and elsewhere in northern Siberia and all that. In those places, those perma. If because of the global warming, if that perma uh, perm the 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 over cap uh, the capping of ice body is disappeared and if permafrost exposed the global warming will be 50 times more than what you are experiencing now mm. that is my message so this is and i i i have given the whole uh the the presentation for the flood as which you know yes. that please yes. uh, i do Thank you, Dr. On, because this warning is very strong, not to only to focus only on sustainability, but also on resilience and get ready because the changes are coming and we need to learn how to manage water better. Thank you. That message was very clear. Uh, and now allow me to uh, move to uh, the last presenter, uh, which is waiting very patiently, but uh, has so much important messages to share with us as well. So last but not least, Nick Schofield, uh, Director of Global Future Research, Visiting Professor Fellow, uh, Just Professor and former CEO of Australian Water Partnership. Um, his title, Future of Life, Are We Entering into a Sixth Mass Extinction of Species? And I'm sure the water will play a role in his comments. Professor Nick, you are more than welcome to take the stage. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. And Natasha, please start his presentation. Here we go. Please, uh, Nick, the floor is yours. Excellent. And uh, greetings from Australia. Right. I, uh, I can say good morning now because we've tipped over to the early hours of... Uh, um, of tomorrow morning. <laughs> Thank you for sticking with us for so long. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure. And uh, thank you for this invitation to talk on this important topic of the uh, future of life. Um, it is, of course, one of the big questions uh, facing humanity. Um, if I go to the next slide, and I thank, thank Natasha for running the slides for me. I've got a slight technical hitch here. Uh, answer this question very quickly up front. Uh, the answer is probably yes, we are probably entering this uh, phase. And um, uh, what evidence do we have for this? If we go to the next slide. Um, I just have four points here. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide, Natasha. Uh, the first one, as you see on that figure on the right, is that freshwater populations have declined 
since 1970, and that's the straight from the Living Planet uh, Index. I mean, that's extraordinary that uh, we can lose yeah. that amount of um, wildlife in such a short period of time. Uh, my second point here is that the number of threatened species is is increased dramatically, and we're looking at a million species that are now threatened uh, with extinction in the next decades and maybe a couple of centuries. The third point is that the rate of species extinction is much, much faster than the normal background rate. And it's up to 100 to 1,000 times faster, which is quite extraordinary, of course. And my final point is that um, uh, a poll of biodiversity scientists uh, shows that they believe that we have entered or at least about to enter a mass extinction event. So what's driving this species loss? And as other panelists have said, uh, it's humans and human behavior. Um, the, the explosion in the human population to now 8 billion and uh, ever increasing per capita consumption. And that's driven six um, themes here that are badly affecting uh, species loss. Firstly, habitat uh, destruction and degradation. In fact, there's only 3% of the planet now left fully intact with all species and uh, plants and perhaps uh, a little less than 25% are lightly touched. The second point here is, as we travel around the world, we take invasive species with us. And what we're seeing is a constant increase in the new invasions in all taxonomic groups in all regions of the world. And of course, invasive species displace native species. Third point over exploitation of species, and uh, Jeff mentioned that up front uh, with fisheries as a common example. Fourth point, pollution um, that has been mentioned in the water sphere. We know that even now 80% of wastewater from human and industrial waste uh, remains untreated as it's uh, put back into the environment. And of course, pollution has a drastic effect on aquatic life. Um, we have heard mention of climate change. Um, and um, of course, the global warming is forcing species to move. Um, a lot of species, uh, plant and uh, animal species, are very uh, susceptible to temperature change. And a lot of moving towards, if they can move, if they have that ability towards uh, cooler climes, uh, and of course, it's the fact that they, climate change and global warming is so fast uh, on a geological uh, and a biological time frame that uh, most species will be caught, uh, caught out in that process and lost. And the final point here, wildlife poaching, which is an ever expanding problem. It's hard to imagine that uh, people poach and uh, send uh, species around the world. And that's particularly threatening to the iconic species. If we go to the next slide, um, can we stop this biodiversity loss? I say maybe, um, question mark, what do we need to do? Well, we need to wind back all those six drivers of biodiversity loss. Um, we can also attempt to save individual species from extinction and a lot of programs in zoos and other institutions uh, having a lot of success in that, but of course it's only one species at a time. Uh, it'd be very important to, to have better protection of wilderness and um, ecosystems, particularly biodiverse ecosystems. There are some protections in place, um, but we need to do a lot better in that space. And of course, um, as David Attenborough would say, we, we have the opportunity now of having damaged the world to restore the world, to enter into a new phase of rewilding and restoration. And, uh, and that's at the very beginning and a lot of work needs to be done. So is there hope? Well, a little bit of hope in that the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity COP15 meeting only fairly recently agreed to adopt what's called the 30 by 30 initiative. 
And this is the plan to protect 30% of land and water that's considered uh, for uh, important for biodiversity by 2030. So 30% by 2030 is where the 3030 comes from. Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, I want to come back to this question of a mass extinction. And um, what we know is that the planet has gone through five of these uh, in the past. Um, going back a little, you know, since the Cambrian explosion, explosion of species 540 million years ago, there's been about roughly one every 100 million years of these events. There's lots and lots of smaller extinction events, but these are the really big ones. And the very approximate definition is uh, of a mass extinction is 75% of all species lost in less than 2.8 million years. And um, might seem an odd, odd definition and time frame, but that's because uh, the longest of these particular events took 2.8 million years. That's, that's where that figure comes from. And you can see from the right hand side there how dramatic those events are. Um, and I've, I've brought that up because in the next slide, I want to look at what we'd learn from those past extinctions and how that relates to the one we're now entering. And the first point is an obvious one that mass extinctions do happen and happen five times in 500 million years. Some are fast, some are slow. Uh, the quickest of them was 5,000 years and the slowest 2.8 million years. The current rate of uh, species loss, as I mentioned, uh, due to humanity now is 10 times faster than any previous mass extinction event. So in a very very different uh, time frame there. Um, but a core message here too is, you know, the evolution of life on Earth is chaotic as a result of these events. Um, evolution isn't smooth, um, systematic and progressive. Um, chance plays its hand through these events and resets evolution quite dramatically. And the fifth mass extinction event, of course, uh, most recent one ended the dinosaurs, favoured mammals, and ultimately led to our own presence on Earth. And perhaps without that asteroid, um, we may not uh, be here today. A key point um, also is that biodiversity recovers after these horrendous events, uh, but it takes millions, and typically 10 million years for that to happen, but it does happen which is encouraging, you know, life on Earth will continue after what humans uh, can exert on it. Um, but when in, in that recovery, the ecological niches are generally not resurrected, um, but uh, new ones are formed, which means new species come along. Um, and the final point here is that all the mass extinctions, whether they're caused by supervolcanoes or asteroids or other, other uh, geological events, um, have involved some degree of climate system change. And that's very relevant um, today as we fa face uh, our own climate change. On my last slide here, um, because I've got a, a futures background, I wanted to mention some stranger futures for life. And uh, I've got four points here. The first one around genetic engineering and genetic engineering is now a refined art that can change life um, through genetic modification of organisms and cloning of organisms. Now that can be used uh, in a biodiversity sense to save endangered species. Um, and it's also possible theoretically to resurrect extinct species if there's enough genetic material uh, remaining and there's a famous mammoth um, where that uh, process is, is now partly underway. The, the third point under genetic engineering, uh, which is a very interesting, if not challenging one, is that we can now create new species in the laboratory. And this is by editing uh, genes and uh, DNA sequences uh, to create entirely new uh, forms. And this was 
forms of life. This was done for the first time in 2020, so fairly recently uh, with fruit fly. And, um, and the final point, their synthetic biology is the creation of life artificially on a computer, where on a computer you design an organism, you design a DNA code, uh, you put it together in a test tube and insert it into an organism and you have a totally new form of life. And um, that, um, that was the first time in 2010, Craig Venter and his group. Wi-Fi. Hello? Yes, please finish uh, your presentation, please. Um, now on uh, my second point, the artificial intelligence that's been in the media a lot recently, and uh, what that's doing is reshaping the human species, our own species. Um, and we know that later this century, um, human intelligence will be ex exceeded by artificial intelligence. And there is work going on to incorporate machine intelligence into humans. And some see this as the next step in human, sometimes called uh, transhumanism. And of course, if we change ourselves radically, we change how we view the world and life. The third point here around alien life, um, I started out in life as an astrophysicist, I've a lot of interest in this. Um, we haven't found life outside Earth as yet, which is very surprising, really. And we've looked at moons and planets and, and other and planetary systems for 60 years now and looked for signals across the whole of the observable universe and haven't yet found any sign of life. It doesn't mean to say it's not there. And when it is found, and if it is found, it could, again, radically change our understanding of what life means. My final point here is that we're actually in the process of humans of taking life from Earth into space and to other worlds. Um, and we're obviously, and by, say, the middle of this century, it looks like we'll have uh, thriving uh, communities on the Moon and on Mars and living longer in space. Uh, and some estimates suggest that colonization of our galaxy, which is a very big place, the Milky Way, uh, has something like a 50 million year time frame. So, so we're on the cusp of some very strange futures for life. With that final point, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, just refer you to a full article on this topic uh, in, in the uh, um, Global Future Research Insights series there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, I'm not really sure how to feel now after this presentation, but it's a very realistic, it's very informative, it's far reaching, and I couldn't ask for a better conclusion of today's discussion. Uh, and now uh, all of us uh, need to go deep and see how can the legal frameworks help us to address the challenges that all of you really presented and how to move forward. But uh, who better to ask for the concluding works than our dear Professor Dr. Uh, Nini. And uh, I'm sure she will give us some guidance for the moves forward. Nini, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am and my friend, Phil Leader. Uh, she is both for me and she is actually much, much more. Whenever I am in trouble, she come and save me, like <laughs> this uh, afternoon. Yeah, we have an electricity card and I have a quite a uh, headache. But uh, no further ado, I would like to share the screen with you for my presentation. And here I have only five minutes. So I am I am aware of it. I will go for slideshow. Can you confirm me that you see it? Yes, we see it. Please go ahead. I'm afraid we lost Nini. Um, as she mentioned, there are the electricity shortages. And uh, so let me 
try to just conclude uh, with today's session. And if she comes in, we will ask her for her wrap up messages as well. But uh, if she's not returning, uh, I'd like to first ask Natasha to just uh, give us the concluding song, which will bring uh, some hope and uh, fresh energy. And then I would also ask uh, for one sentence from each of the speakers, uh, based on what we've heard today here, would you share the message in the chat in case we, uh, we will have Nini back for the wrap up? If not, uh, we will use your concluding messages to finish today's incredibly rich session. But first, the song. You pray to the heavens, demand of the sky Beg of the earth, crying silently, why? Why do they seek so much blood from a stone? What do you do when you feel so alone? That's all I do. Reach out when you need direction Reach out You'll find connection Reach out through storm and through fear We are water We are here Step in the current and bathe in the stream Together we rise and Together we dream, join with our families, we are not afraid, for droplet by droplet an ocean is made. Reach out when you need direction, reach out, you'll find connection. very much to you and her team for this beautiful song and soon we will have a video session a video to come with it as well i see that nini is back so nini please give us just uh, key messages from you uh, for the closure <laughs> of this exceptional <laughs> session i am so sorry um i am really very very sorry but uh, if because you give me the chance i will do it again I will, yeah, 
I'm opening my PowerPoint. You can uh, just speak, Nini. You don't need to show it. You can just say with your words, with your rich messages that you always. Yeah, should. it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I will. I will. Actually, what you have listened, everything uh, from the other speakers that um, I have uh, in mind that we found the like-minded people. So do you, do you already see my uh, slides? No, we just see your files, your directory. We do not see the PowerPoint itself. Why it is eh? Zoom quit uh, unexpectedly, but never mind. Since I can talk, I will just go to the second slide. The key messages. The key messages are like: uh, Are we entering a six mass extinction? So the answer is probably yes. Can we stop it? Maybe. And that maybe is the thing that it gives me, hang on, hang on. 100 years ago, even 25 years ago, it was about the right to take water. Just over 10 years ago, the emphasis shifted to the right to have water. And five years ago, we saw the creation of rights for rivers. So rivers are treated as human being. In eco civilization, we said we are water, the music you just hear. So that is really <clears throat> coincided with uh, our feeling towards the world, biodiversity, and the nature. And today we are talking about a broader concept of rights for water. So actually this key statement, I got it from Professor Jeff Kemkin. There has been some great progress, but we still have a long way to go. Okay, the third key message is differences of perceptions, values, needs, and interests are not exclusive of each other. They can coexist and even enhance one another. And that key message is from Lena, the lawyer, and the greatest kindness is like water. Uh, this is by Dr. Wang. He quoted the Lao Zi, the founder of Taoism. So when you hear him, complete 10 minutes and his rich message, but the quote he gave us is the greatest kindness, meaning we really have to go back to the inner journey. And the Dr. Omye, who talks about flood and drought, actually, although he was technically presenting the, the key message, the core a uh, quote from him is the eight noble path. Eight noble path is the path that leads to the cessation of stress. Our world become really stressful and everything is very, very stressful. What we, do we need to do? Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort and right mindfulness, right concentration. So these are the eight things we need to do. Then I go to the to-do list. Although the key messages give us for the task we have to do for our lifetime, plus our generation, next generation has to continue that work. We also have to concentrate on what can we do in 2023? What can we do in 2024? Therefore, in to-do list, I only put two. Number one, Rethinking water, peace, 
prosperity, spiritual transformation, and deep commitment, walking the talk to successfully implement the 17 SDGs, these sustainable development goals. Present time now today, the 31st of May, 2023 to 2030. Also beyond 2030 for the future generations. And the second is the practical thing. We started this year pilot projects in four areas, but not limited to water in eco civilization is the first one, new water governance slash management paradigm. So new paradigm we are uh, promoting. That's number two, water and gender. You will see the next webinar on 29th of June. Uh, you will see that project. And the fourth one is water, culture, and art. It is pity that uh, we do not, you, we, I cannot share your screen, but in on our my screen, you can see the fish, very beautiful fish. And that is the painting by Miss uh, Deirdre. She asked us, uh, are we water or are we fish? Actually, we answer, we are water. So this is the way we try to incorporate the art and the culture. Oh, wonderful. Finally, do you see it? I, I put it on, my dear. You did. Thank you, view leader. So this is the fish, okay? So eco-civilization has a clear mission. The, number one is to create planet Earth as an eco-zone of the universe with its rich biodiversity as its core. The second is to, to populate the universe by using technology, curiosity, and greatness. And there is a catch, the greatness. What do you mean by greatness? If we are asked, it is to control the technology. Actually, Nick has talked about AI and he foresee that maybe one time the artificial intelligence may exceed and overpower the human intelligence. Why? Because we are really very uh, ego centric. May I go to number eight, uh, please? We are very egocentric and we need to be egocentric. Uh, feel later, can you? Ah, okay, I got it. Okay, so here we also ask the like-minded organizations and uh, the individuals to join us because we have all these uh, to-do lists and we have to rethink. Huh? To rethink only three or four points I will pick. Our water systems directly affected by climate change and climate change has been accelerated by human activities. Humans' activities are guided by knowledge, capacity and spirituality of the decision makers. From individual to state, state to global and global coming back to local, that's why we talk about globalization. Globally, technical and financial capabilities are sufficient enough. I mean it, really, I mean it, because in my country, even the trishore rider who earned the money so little and the president who earned the money so big, but they still manage their own household by their own scale. That is why globally, we have enough capability for financial and technical. What is short is our self-commitment. Therefore, all we need is the new way of thinking and self-commitment to change. Where do we start? Is inner change. Only then we can co-create the real inclusive decision support system. Nowadays we say we see inclusive, but it is not really. It is the fake inclusiveness. Hence, we forge a dream team to start working on a pilot project as one of the commitments to UN Water Action Decade. 
In fact, Eco Civilization Year of Water 2023 itself is an innovative contribution to the UN Water Action Decade because it has never been proposing to change the mind and the way at the same time together in order to improve the water governance and the water management. I think I have said enough and I am, I dare not to uh, take more time, but this is very important. Message to the world from the year of water. At the last one, socio-technology, systems science and spiritual transformation. When we put it, and it was the slide I copied from our chair, it means it is committed from the top to the bottom. Therefore, please, please kindly join us. Thank you for all of us. Thank you from all of us for your time and attention. Thank you, Nini, for this uh, very thorough wrap up. And thank you all. Thank you to all the lecturers. I mean, you guys are incredible. You stayed with us all the way. You made comments in the chat and especially to Australia. I know it's already the next day. And yeah. thank you very much for your commitment. Thank you for all the participants and your comments in the chat. Everything has enriched us. And we are looking forward to continue to engage on this essential topic for life, but also for global collaboration. So all the best until the next time. And uh, please let's take all these rich messages with us and proliferate and put seeds wherever we can, because that's the only way to really make a change. Thank you very much and all the best until the next. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Nini. Thank you. Thank you, panelists and audience.